Last week, if you aren't here, let's get caught up. We started a study on this man, this Bible character called Joseph. He is going to have at least 70 similarities. We call them foreshadowings of Jesus. Last week, we found out that he got sold for silver. So did Jesus. That's one example. And so what happened is Joseph, you, you start to read about him when he's about 17 years of age. And prior to this, you've heard some of the Sunday school stories about the coat of many colors. His dad makes him a coat, and it's a gift. But sometimes when, you, when everybody doesn't get what you got, sometimes you're the, the, um, you, know, you become the bullseye of their angst, of their jealousy their bitterness. And so what happened was his father made him a coat but didn't make his brothers a coat like his. And all of a sudden now all of his brothers really don't like this guy. And to make matters worse, he not only gets a coat that nobody else gets, but he has a dream, not just one dream, but two dreams. And those dreams, he says, is from God. So now God is giving Joseph something that his brothers are not yet experiencing. And when that happens, because a lot of times God will, t will give you a deposit, will tell you, will give you a direction, maybe even a dream or a word. And if it doesn't go out to everybody, don't be surprised that when you mention what God has told you, people criticize. Not everybody's going to be happy about you getting a word from the Lord. Everybody should be happy, but they won't be because they didn't get one. Ever notice that people are jealous? Say amen. Yeah, they want everybody to get the same. And I made some people mad the other day saying that God isn't fair. No, he really isn't. You know, you say, well, pastor, God loves everybody. He does. His love is, is for everyone at the same measure. He is equitable in his love. But tell Peter, James, and John and the other eight that were in the Garden of Gethsemane when he told eight of them, you stay here, you three come over here with me. Everybody didn't get to go over here. See, if God was equitable where everybody got the same, he'd have just said, oh, come on over here, fellas. Everybody come over here. But sometimes our responsibility and our anointing is different. It doesn't mean it's any better or any less. It's just different than maybe what you're walking in. And sometimes when you want to walk in somebody else's call, you get frustrated. That's what his brothers do. They get frustrated. They criticize. They actually, the Bible says, hated him for his dream. So his father sends him on a mission to go give his brothers, which are shepherds, some provision and make sure that they're okay. He tells him where to go. And when he goes there, none of them are there. And they've moved the flock just a short distance. So somebody tells him, no, they're not here. They're over there. And while he's coming, his brother see him. <laughs> And his brothers identify him through his call. And they say, oh, there's the dreamer that had the dreams. Let's do this. Let's kill him. And if we kill him, we'll kill the dream. And we'll see what becomes of his dream then. Well, one of his brothers finally gets some compassion in his heart. And he said, you know what, guys? I don't like him either. But he's our brother. We can't kill him. Let's sell him. Let's grab him, beat him up. We'll take that coat that dad gave him. We'll strip him of that coat. We'll dip it in some animal's blood. And we will tell our dad that an animal killed him on his way on the mission that he sent him on. And then we'll sell him into slavery and they'll kill him for us. That's where we stopped last week. As he's laying there bruised and beaten up by people that should have loved him. He's in the bottom of this pit. And in the bottom of that pit, sometimes we think that we're going through things. And when we go through things that are challenging, sometimes we equate those difficult moments as punishment from God. Sometimes that's, that's furthest from the truth. See, he had been beaten up, put in that pit, but God was showing him that the dream that was given to him at 17 wouldn't be realized till he was 30, and by the time he gets to 30, he's going to live somewhere else. See, have you ever noticed that when God gives you a word, you always want to put it in the context in which you currently are in? See, I thought I was going to be in Northwest Florida forever. 
You know, and when I went up there to this little farming community called Alpha, Florida, it was about 30 minutes from my hometown of Panama City, and I knew where the back roads were. I knew all the familiarity of the lay of the land. I had been fishing with my dad in the oceans, the world's most beautiful beaches. I thought God's call for me was going to be right there in that little community forever. But now I've been here 19 years, and the dream that I had going into the ministry Part of it was, was perfected in Northwest Florida, but the majority of it has been realized here. And when I was thinking of my dream and putting it into context, see, what we didn't realize is that God's dream that he gave uh, Joseph was for him to ascend to a position of authority, almost to a throne where his brothers and his mom and dad would bow down to him a position of authority and responsibility. And sometimes you think when God gives you a word, oh, he's just going to come and set up the throne that he's promised me right here. You may have to go through a process to get there. It may even go from good to bad and from bad to worse before you arrive. Are you still willing to go? See, because sometimes we want the position without the preparation. I said this in our staff meeting, and I thought it was so good. And if you write notes, this is one of those times to wrote. If God gives you the position without the preparation, it would equal his cruelty because he is setting you up for failure because you have no idea how to keep what he's giving you. But if he takes you through a a process of preparation that sometimes is preparing you, honing your character, letting you see some things inside of you that you don't normally want to look at, then by the time you get to the position, you're prepared to keep it. Can somebody say amen? Well, he gets out of this pit, they put chains on him, and they sell him into slavery. And last week, I finished up the sermon. Y'all get the, I know I can get to at least right here. I can't go down there today, they said. But the chains, the chains, he's in chains. He's following a band of Ishmaelites. And in his flesh, he has to be thinking, how is the dream going to be fulfilled? How am I going to ascend to a position of power and authority as a slave? What he did not know was that the Ishmaelites God did not cause his brothers to beat him up, didn't cause his brothers to throw him in the pit, but God's God enough, according to Romans, to work all things together for the good. And what he does not realize in underneath the bruises, underneath the scrapes and the pain, underneath the frustration, he's moving every step closer to Egypt where the throne is. Sometimes we give up on our dreams in the midst of our pain, and that's what I preached last week. But when they get to... Egypt, these Ishmaelites sell him as a slave to a man named Potiphar. Now, Potiphar is, is kind of like a general in the Egyptian army. He has power, he has prestige, he's wealthy, he's, he's got it going on, and he keeps company with Pharaoh, the guy that has the thrones. And all of a sudden, what Joseph does not see, because we get the benefit of knowing the end of the story, all he sees is slavery. And the Bible says something great about him. And I'm going to, I want you to listen to what the Bible says. The Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master, and his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. Wouldn't that be a wonderful testimony that sometimes we can't get to the real you because the real you is is covered up with all of the complaints of how you got to where you are. He's still a slave. You say, well, pastor, I just want the favor of the Lord. And if I find the favor of the Lord, the joy of the Lord will be my strength. He had the favor of the Lord. Brother was a slave. It didn't say he got the favor of the Lord and it freed him from the bonds of his slavery. No, it didn't say that at all. That's what we wanted to say. 
But wouldn't it be wonderful for people to know that the hand of the Lord is upon you even when you're going through the worst trial of your life? That something tangible, see that becomes repetitive in this story, that every place that Joseph goes, they see something tangible that the hand of the Lord is upon him. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Everybody knows that we sing the praise to the Lord here in this building when everybody's coming together and we have the benefit of more than one voice and we have wonderful musicians that lead us and they have wonderful voices and they have microphones and they sing so beautifully and we can kind of fill in. I want to know when you're in your pit, do you still sing? Do you still praise? Does your hand go up in the middle of you going from bad to worse and say, God, I thank you for the promise that you were with me in the pit. I heard your voice in the midst of the pit and said, I'm not going to leave you nor forsake you. And then when I found myself from bad to worse in the midst of slavery, you were with me here and every Everything that I put my hand upon, you blessed. Man, the world's looking for some Josephs that will get in the mess with them. That's one of the characteristics of Citygate, that we get in folks' mess, and they see that the hand of God is upon us in the midst of the mess, and we get to see the glory of God revealed. Amen. So here he is. He's in slavery. Everything that he touches is successful. So now he has success. He's smart. But the Bible says he's got one more problem. He's handsome. (laughs) See, sometimes we have to stop right here and teach for a moment. Because you think that if you ever get to a place of success where God's blessing you, that the temptation becomes minimized. I promise you, the more successful you get, the more the temptation comes. The more opportunity for people to see the glory of God revealed in you, the greater the attack will be. Because there's a moment where he wants to tear down the credibility. Here's a guy in slavery, treated like a peer by the general of the army of the Egyptians. And now his wife's looking at him, going, ooh. (laughs) And he, the Bible literally says that his master Potiphar treats him like an equal in the house. He's not treated like a slave. He's treated like an equal. And that's double the trouble because now the man that trusts you the most, his most prized, uh, ladies, forgive me for this. It's just part of the story. His most prized possession is the very thing that wants to bring dishonor to the man that has character. See, a lot of the times you think that here's this woman, she's coming on to him, and it's not just a one-time come on. The Bible literally says she does it over and over and over again. Like every time she sees him and he turn, and Potiphar turns around, she's looking at him. Going, that becomes hard. See, sometimes when you're a, a person of character, you forget sometimes that right is always right. Martin Luther King says it this way. I taught it to the men of honor on Tuesday night. He says, cowards ask the question, is it safe? Consensus asks the question, is it popular? But character asks the question, is it right? See, sometimes you think that because I'm I'm fixing to throw some people's theology right out the window. I'm going to get some emails from this. I've prepared. It's okay. Send them on. All I'm doing is telling you what the Bible says, not what you hope it says. Okay? Because sometimes people believe that if they do the right thing, God is now obligated to reward them for their good deed. Right is always right, no matter how difficult the challenges are. It will never change based upon somebody else's reaction because your character and honor does not, it does not extend to the benefit of if you do the right thing, everybody else does the right thing. Sometimes you do the right thing and you still pay the price for it. I'm going to get back to that. So hold on to that. Buckle up. We're going to get back to that. That's good teaching. 
So literally, Potiphar is teaching, is, is giving him everything except his wife. And everything, it literally says the only thing he worries about is chewing his food. You don't believe me? Listen. It says, but he refused. It said this. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge because of him. He had no concern about anything but the food that he ate. And Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in his house. And he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this, in this house than I am. Nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. And how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? As he spoke to Joseph day after day, he would, or as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her to lie beside her or be with her. So he is telling her, and I want you to get the thing. He's not doing this simply because the guy's treating him well. He's not measuring his character based upon the frailty of another man's goodness. He says, not only would that be disrespectful to that man, but I've got a higher calling that said it would be disrespectful to my God. The sin and the wickedness was not against Potiphar, if you noticed. It was against God. You got to do the right thing no matter what somebody else does. Tell your neighbor, do the right thing. Because we, we want rewarded. Be careful. Well, pastor, I deserve it because I did the right thing. Man, right's always right. It's like somebody trying to, you know, people can't make you do anything. You realize that, right? Now, their bad behavior can contribute to you having issues in your life. That's, that's without debate. But they can't make you do anything. Because if there's ever a brother in the Bible that should have been misbehaved because of people treating him bad and hurting him and abusing him, this is a brother that could have justified that by saying, hey, I have been beaten by my own brother, sold into slavery by the people that are supposed to love me, and then I went from slavery to here, and now I'm doing the right thing, trying to resist a woman, and she keeps tempting me, and I keep telling her, I've got to do the right thing. You say, Pastor, I I don't know what you're talking about. Right is always right, no matter what the difference is. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you, during COVID, you lost your job. People have done that. Let's say because you lost your job, you now have financial struggles. Let's even add to that. You have financial struggles because you lost your job because of COVID, and you have children, and you're struggling to provide food for the table. Is it okay for you to go rob the bank? No. No. Because you know what's going to happen when you get caught? Prison. Because the judge is going to say, oh, man, it makes sense why you did it, but there were better ways to do it than to do something wrong. And now, even though you had good motives, you committed a crime. Brothers, kiss your kids because you're going to jail. They don't, get the, they don't get the note. The teller doesn't get the note and go, hey, I'm having problems. I'm going to have to rob you. <laughs> no, man. Wrong is always wrong. And in this case, Joseph has to do the right thing. Doing the right thing gets him more harm, more crisis, more trauma. Yes, he's doing the right thing. And if you're doing the right thing, shouldn't God come on the scene and do something right for you? So what's he do? He says no. Gets convicted as if he said yes. See, one day she found him in the house and she grabbed hold of him. You talking about a sexual harassment suit at work? Yeah, that's, this is the perfect example. She's, he's, he did what he always did. Get away from me. Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> you keep doing this thing. and I, I keep telling you no. She said, I ain't taking no for an answer today. And she grabs hold of him because there's nobody else in the house. Bible literally says he wiggles out of his coat. Dreams and coats get this guy in a bunch of troubles. He wiggles out of his coat and runs out of the house. She said, I'm going to teach him. He resisted me. She screams rape. And when she screams rape, she has this coat. 
Here's the proof. He tried to come into me. I fought him off. I snatched him, the coat off of him. He realized that I was going to scream, and he ran out. They believed her. Where's God? Shouldn't the heavens have opened and the sun come down and, and shined upon Joseph and said, this is my dude. I really like him. He's telling the truth. She's lying on him. No, that's not what happened. He goes from bad to worse. He gets convicted of a crime he did not commit and goes to prison. So now he's gone from a pit. That's bad. Say bad. Then he goes to Potiphar. That's slavery. That's worse. And then he goes to prison. That's really, really worse. How's this guy's dream ever going to come true? Amy, get ready to play me something. This prison thing isn't a temporary inconvenience. It's 12 years. See, don't you think that God should have come like after a month and said, hey, man, you did the right thing. Thank you. I appreciate it. High five on your character. He seems to be getting further and further away from his dream, but God seems to nav be navigating things to where he, what he doesn't realize is he's closer to the throne than he's ever been before. The prison, even the, God, the warden of the prison says, I saw the hand of the Lord upon him. You know what the Bible says about Joseph when he goes to prison? And the Lord was with him. Yeah, the same one in the pit, same one in the slavery, same one in the prison. Twelve years, now he's over all the new, he's over the whole prison. He's in charge of orientation. We get two new prisoners. One's a baker, the other's a cupbearer. Most of us don't know what a cupbearer is, so I call him the butler. Baker and the butler. They come and... They're in orientation, said, oh, man, you used to test uh, the wine for the king. You're the cupbearer. You're the butler. I, man, you have responsibility. You're trustworthy. i got a place for you. Oh, you're the king's baker. You, 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 um, we've got a place for you. It may not be in the kitchen because if you was a good cook, you wouldn't be here. <coughs> One day they show up for work, and they're sad. They're going to get me some lights very soon where I can get down there because I would love nothing more than to come down right there and really look you in the eyes and tell you this. See, sometimes God doesn't cause the pain in our life, but he's God enough to use it for us to reveal his glory because you know what wounded people see? I know that there's a saying, say, wounded people, broke people, break people. They also see broken people. Brother walked into the room and saw somebody as sad as he was and said, hey, man, what's wrong? They said, man, I had a crazy dream last night. He said, do tell. I've had dreams myself. They got me into trouble. What's your dream all about? You got any coats? <laughs> that was a good joke right there. Y'all missed it. Here's the dream. The butler says, I dreamed, and all of a sudden there was this vine that come up, and then there were three buds, and those three buds turned into three clusters of grapes. I grabbed the three grapes, I squoze them, put them in a cup, and I walked them over to the hand of Pharaoh and gave them back. What do you think that means? He said, oh man, I've got good news for you. In three days, you're getting out of prison, and you're going to be restored to the very job you had next to Pharaoh. You ever, hear, ever been around somebody that got good news and thought you deserved it too? See, I, I, I'm, I, in this story, I'm the baker. As many of you know, in October, me and Michelle had COVID. And I told you last week, it cost me $125 three ways to get tested. But I wanted to know quick. It was worth $125 to me. So $375 later, You ever notice people love Michelle more than me? I mean, even y'all, y'all love Michelle, you like me. And that's okay, I'd rather you do that. 
They went over there to her, literally, Josh. They went over to her, and she's afraid, she's anxious, she's nervous. And she says, put your arms around me so I don't jerk. So I got my arms around her. I'm ready to put the, you know, what's happening on her in case she gets squirrely. They see the fear in her eyes. They barely put the Q-tip up her nose. They're like squirreling right there. And they put it in the little thing and put the cap on it. I said, it's my turn. They shoved that thing all the way up to my brain. They twirled around in there a little while and then snatched it out. They didn't even say they were sorry. <laughs> well, we paid for rapid results. We were coming back from the lab and we got all right downtown here. We were going to go over the bridge. We live in Cape Coral. We were going to go over the bridge and the phone rang and it was the lab. Now, I, I told y'all I had a trip scheduled to Indiana and I really wanted to go. So I clicked the phone. It's on speakerphone. Guy on the other end of the phone says, is Michelle Pleasant available? I said, she is. She's here in this car. I said, we got you on speaker. Go ahead. I'm her husband. He said, you're David Pleasant? He, I said, yes. He said, I'm going to get to you in a minute. He said, Miss Pleasant? <laughs> it, hey, man, it happens all the time. He said, Miss Pleasant, we got good news. You're negative. When he said that, I lit up like a Christmas tree. I was like, well, brother, we had somebody come that was a family member, and he, had, he, he, um, he, you know, he got exposed, and he's positive, and we were just making sure that we weren't positive because we were around a bunch of people at a time. He said, oh, no, 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 you've misunderstood. I said, she's negative. You, David Pleasant, are positive. I'm thinking, how could this be? <laughs> well, that's what happened to the butler or the baker. He heard the good news. He said, I had a dream too. He said there was some bread involved and a big basket on somebody's head and he's expecting the same interpretation. Well, the interpretation comes, brother, you really don't want to hear. No, I really want to hear. Three days you're going to get executed. Yeah, hung from a tree. And then he even goes further and said, the birds are going to eat your flesh. That's not good news. <laughs> That's not good news. The only thing that he asked, I want, I want to show you something in Scripture because i got to teach here for two more minutes. I want to show you something in Scripture. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph, and he said to him, In my dream there was a vine before me, and, no, and the vine there were three branches, and as soon as it budded, it blossomed and shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed it, the, the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, This is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days Pharaoh will lift up your head, restore you to your office, and you shall and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly. When you were his cupbearer, only remember me when it is well with you, and please do, do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this house, for I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. See, sometimes people get frozen in time by a trauma. See, even though he's gotten out of the pit years ago, he's now f filtered everything that he's experienced from that moment from being in that pit. He went, I went from the pit, but I stayed in the pit emotionally. And I went from there to slavery and there from slavery to prison. But God was with me the whole time, but I'm in a mess and I need your help. When you get back to the palace, please tell Pharaoh, I don't belong to be here. I've got good news for anybody that's been frozen in time to, because of a trauma. God is so great and so big. He is not going to dismiss that trauma and minimize that trauma, but God can go back in time right to your pit and get you to say, I was here when you were in here the first time, and I'm here to deliver you from the pain right now. And from the pain, you've got a tomorrow. You don't have to keep reliving this day. You don't have to re keep reliving this moment. I've got a grace for you that is sufficient. I've got a plan for you that is joyful. This does not have to rob you of your tomorrows. It robbed you of your moment, but it does not have to rob you of your tomorrows. I am capable. God is capable. Let me just sit down here for a minute and talk to you. I hate being so high where I can't look you in the eyes. 
I'm going to get over here where they can see me on that camera. wonder how long it took. Was it a week, a month, two months, six months? When do you think he finally realized that the guy that he told not to forget him had forgotten him? You know, he probably, when the three days come and the guy went back to Pharaoh's, he probably said, man, I'm out of here now. This is finally the end of it. You may have to wait in your moment to get your complete healing and get to your, your, your palace. Don't quit now. You may be so close you could taste it. When people, this is the last attack of the enemy upon our minds, is when you feel people have abandoned you. And you know what? They will. They will forget you just like this man. I could see him packing up his stuff, saying, I'm going to get out of here any minute. I just can't wait. Finally, finally, I'm going to be, finally, I'm going to be able to go out and live. I don't know how this dream's going to take place. And then to realize day after day, finally, it, it happens. And in my mind, this is what happens. He finally realizes the guy has forgotten him. And the same voice of the Holy Spirit that spoke to him in a pit said, I'm here too. I haven't forgotten you. There's not been a day that you've been alive that I did not know where you were. There's not a moment you've experienced that I was not aware and prepared provision for your healing. It's still a moment away. I can't promise you you're getting out today. But hold on. I won't, I won't never leave you. Because I want you to know that if you know a God that will go in a pit with you and go in a slavery with you and go into prison with you, you better know he'll go to the throne with you. He said, don't give up now. People have forgotten you. But he will not. Amy's about to lead us in a moment of worship and I want you to go back in your mind for a moment to your pit experiences, to your slavery experiences, maybe even to your prison experiences that none of us deserved. And I want you to realize that God is so capable that he's the one that gave you the dream in the first place and he knew that you had stops at the pit. He knew you had stops at the prison. He knew you had stops at, in slavery. Miss Ann does a lot of ministry to hurting people. Miss Ann, you've told me some of your testimony and some of the things you've gone through you sense hurting people because you've been hurt before and oh how God has used a moment that we thought that the enemy designed to kill or distract or frustrate you to give up that if it becomes so painful but man when you look behind you now and you see the reward you see woman after woman man after man because you do both see them whole and and it, it, you know what? They haven't yet made you famous, but they sure have made you sure have made Jesus famous. What's God going to do with you in the moment of your pain when you hold on to a dream? Everybody knows you sing on Sunday, but do they know you sing in prison? Let's worship. begins to fall on the name of Jesus I will call for I know my God is in control and his purpose is unshakable it doesn't matter what I feel doesn't matter what I see, my hope will always be your promises to me. Now I'm casting out all fear, for your love is 
Say, Pastor, why did you preach this message? Why didn't you just preach him from the pit to the palace? Because the Bible has this in it. And some of you are there. And I want you to know that his promises, he'll keep the dream secure. I'm going to tell a story at the risk of someone getting upset with me, but it's really... I'm wanting to compliment. It's one of the greatest moves of God I've ever seen in my life. We had a lady, a family in our church years and years ago that had a tragic accident in her family and her son died. He was 15. It's one of my son's best friends. And it shook our church. It shook, shook me. It's just such a sad moment, I remember. And it was in that moment that I didn't have words to say. I was going to make it okay. And yes, God didn't cause the accident, but he certainly started to show himself to be God. And at this young man's service, memorial service, 200 young men and women got saved that day. And he said, man, that's great. Yeah, but it's still sad. It's great and sad all at the same time. This mother was really I mean she was a mess and every Sunday we would start to worship and she would just get out of her chair and she would just collapse at at the um, kind of the altar area grief just a struggle and it happened for months and we were very gracious you know who's going to go tell the lady hey can't do that here no where if she can't do it here where can she do it it 
There's a lady here. I'm not going to mention her name because I don't know that she would give me permission to. That had gone through what this woman had gone through. And there was a special Sunday. That that lady come and did what she did before. In the midst of her pain. This lady walked up. Picked her up. Took her to a place called the prayer chapel. Which was behind our, our sanctuary. And in that prayer chapel, she, she, I, I got the Reader's Digest version. It went something like this. Everybody in that room is sympathetic to what you've gone through. But I know what you've gone through because I'm one of the few people that have gone where you have gone. And it's time to live again. God got me out of the place where you are. And it was only through his grace and his power that he got me to here. But it's time for you to stop being frozen in a moment and start living again. And I want to tell that lady that she's here right now. I saw, just like the Bible says, I saw that they, whoever Joseph was around, that they said, I saw the hand of the Lord upon you. I want that lady to know that I saw the hand of the Lord upon you. No, God didn't cause the accidents and he didn't cause the tragedies, but God sure placed something in you that had gave a compassion to know what it was like to hurt like that and still hold on to a dream that you could live again and you were able to pass that on to somebody else. So I'm telling you, I know you're still in prison and I know you may not deserve why you're there but I want you to know you may be one step closer to your palace than you've ever thought and please don't give up on the dream because God hasn't given up on you he has not forgotten you so let's pray father right now for all of those under the sound of my voice that feel like you are a million miles away they feel forgotten, broken, hurt, and wounded. Father, I stand here and I pray on their behalf, but God, while I pray, I trust that the Holy Spirit is moving upon their heart, their minds, their soul, and letting them know that you have never abandoned them. You knew the circumstances when you gave them the dream, the word, the responsibility, the call, the anointing. And God, you have, the Bible says that your gifts and calling are irrevocable. That means that God, no matter what we've went through, you haven't changed your mind about us. Some of the things we didn't deserve, but God, many things in my life I chose. Some of the things that I found myself in doing what I was doing, Father, put me in a place my decisions put me in but there's people under the sound of my voice father that that it was nothing that they did it was nothing that they could have done but god it was the evil of others just like that woman in potiphar's house just because they were willing to be the, do the right thing doesn't mean everybody else was willing to do the right thing and they were wounded in the in the, as collateral damage father let healing virtue flow right now let the power of the holy spirit heal a soul father not just that on on a weekly basis we ask you to forgive us of our sins but God right now I'm not asking you just to forgive people of their sins I'm asking you to heal their soul I'm asking you to heal the brokenness on the inside their pit moments their prison moments father right now that they probably have felt like people have forgotten them and they've been overlooked but God let them know that the eyes of the Lord have always been upon them that they are never out of your reach and their palace is right around the corner and I give you the praise and the honor and the glory in Jesus name and everybody said amen could we give the Lord just an ovation of praise